Good afternoon. Well, we have about a minute. So no, it's four. It's four o'clock sharp. Uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone online. Welcome aboard. Uh, this afternoon on track C, we're going to talk about how the CDOs must must address new regulations that are being introduced to uh, to address cybersecurity concerns and challenges. And I want to introduce Dr. Stu Madnick, who has. Uh, we all know and love uh, from his time here at MIT. Dr. Madnick, the floor is yours. I'll sure. be walking around with microphones if you'd like to ask questions during the presentation. Yeah, very good. And the microphones are very handy because of the people who are watching remotely, they can't hear you otherwise. So a couple things I want to do here today. Uh, let me see if this, it looked like it's working, okay. Go back here a second. Okay. So. Uh, <coughs> There are, there are lots of things that, as you know, CDOs do, and, and we've done a lot of research, uh, Rich Wang and the team, of looking how the CDO role has evolved and changed over time. I'm raising a, a new issue which some CDOs may not have yet experienced, and those other of you may be just beginning to experience, and that's the issue of regulation. Now, there are certain industries like financial services that have always had a certain amount of regulations going on. But now there are regulations popping up all over the place for all kinds of industries in all kinds of ways. And so I often say a flood of new regulations are coming. Do you have your lifeboats ready? So I'm, for those of you who have experienced, I appreciate you commenting what you've seen. For those who haven't, I'll give you an idea of what's, what's going on out there that you might want to be aware of for the future. Okay, what's prompting all of this? Well, I don't know if any of you have been hiding under a rock, but there's always press coverage, not every single day. In fact, it turns out I decided once if the newspapers published any, every cyber attack that took place every day, there would not be room for anything else in the newspaper. So you always, all you're seeing is like the tip of the iceberg, if you will. But enough of it is happening. You know, when the top executives of Colonial Pipeline testified before Congress on television, you know, so the congressmen and, and legislators say, well, gee whiz, I guess there's probably something going on out there and we got to do something about it. Now, I don't know the last time you saw a congressman writing cryptographic codes or not, so that is not likely to be the kind of things that they would do. The kind of things they do is pass new laws and regulations, and so that's what they're up to. they got to do something. They're coming out of the White House from Congress. You pick any three letters, put it together, and it's an agency probably issuing regulations. Uh, at last count, which is like two weeks ago, at least 36 states, governments, and of course countries around the world, the European Union, India, China, Russia, and so on. So they're, they're, they're popping up like weeds everywhere. And almost all of these regulations have some impact on a CDO. Now, how your particular company sees them, a, whether they're even aware of them or concerned about them, how they've delegated responsibility, who's going to deal with them, but all of them touch, or most of them touch on the CDO to some extent. So whether you're the leader or you're merely part of the team, all of you will have some consequence on it. So there, I'm going to talk today about five areas. Not the only ones, but they're the five, I think, most interesting ones to talk about. And what I put here kind of in, I don't know what color it is, gold or brown or whatever you want to call it, red, uh, are things I think CDOs have some responsibility about. So these are regulations on these topics. And even the ones where the CDO may not have primary responsibility, I think the CDO as an as a executive of the organization has some things to say about it. So these are the five topics that I'm going to try to talk about. So let me pause for a second before going any further. Have any of you in your, in your organization had to deal with any of these regulations, any of these kinds of regulations yet so far? Anybody? I see a couple of hands go. So stop back there. Which one and in what way? Is it on? Is this on? Oh, there it is. It's on. Hey, hey, hey. Well, I am with the government. So oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so, well, by the way, I should uh, tell you, a lot of regulations actually apply to the government, as yes. it turns out, and sometimes first. I, my favorite one so far, though, is the uh, Algorithmic Accountability Act of 2022. Oh, um, that one I'm not familiar with. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, uh, my long story short about that is that if you look at like, EU law, um, they're particularly look, uh, applying 
policies based on use case, yeah. which is much more logical to me yeah. than, for example, early in twenty in, in the beginning, uh, twenty uh, nineteen and so far, where DHS and other uh, organizations were applying it, ba applying policies based on the technology, which doesn't make any sense, right? piece of rope can be both a very useful tool as well as something to kill people with, oh, yeah. right? So, but are you going to regulate a piece of rope the <laughs> right, always the same way? No. So I personally... Just, just interrupt uh, you for a second. Don't yeah, take anyway. this the wrong way. No, no don't, don't go. Yeah, so uh, one of the problems you have with, with, with re legislators is often they don't know a lot about the technology, the application. This is a secret. Don't let the word out. So, so sometimes they come up with regulations that sure sound good at home, but not clear. Keep going. I'll, I'll stop after I just mention one other that's been yes. a topic. But the one that was the big bugaboo for us for a while was 13960, an executive order, which basically said, hey, all you agencies need to be able to um, report on what are the artificial intelligence applications you're using in your agencies. And we had to all ship up these huge, gigantic lists. And I was deeply depressed by what people put up there. Because I'm sorry, but statistics are used in AI, but they are themselves not AI, <laughs> right? Machine learning, used, it is not AI. And the definition itself, though, has been a horribly vague, annoying thing, right? AI equals human intelligence. Human intelligence is, de is defined by, <laughs> right? And then you can go on to epistemological studies about that. But, but it, anyway, it's been vague. Uh, I'd say 2019, my experience, 2019, horrible vague descriptions. 22, I think we're finally getting more refinement where they're finally switching it to use case versus like technology. Okay, good. So I, I, one more over here, then I want to move on. Because for those of you who haven't experienced, there's fun coming down the road. Go ahead. Another government employee. Okay. <laughs> State. Um, to add the wrinkle to that, healthcare yeah. in, in government. So of course, all of these um, plus privacy right. regulations around that. Um, I'll just add to what Duncan, Damien, uh, Damien said. Um, most legislation at the federal and state level is born out of fear. Yeah. So that's something that we're actively trying to educate. No, the legislature will, will not get the details of the technology or the difference between ML and AI, or even an algorithm and <laughs> AI for that matter. But we can help them understand what is fear-mongering versus what is more yeah. realistic? So. Exactly. So once again, we'll have a chance for others to, to, to comment later, but I just wanted to give you a feeling that is going on out there for those of you who haven't experienced it. So I'm going to go through each of these five relatively quickly just to give you the flavor. And those who have interest in it, we have a number of research papers that go in, into more depth. Okay. So the first one, I, I, and I, I kind of randomly move around the order of them. Uh, this one I put early because... Uh, it has two elements to it that one of them should be near and dear to your hearts. The one people mostly talk about, it turns out, is SBOM, or Software Bill of Materials. And how many of you here know what I'm talking about when I talk about Log4j? Anybody? A handful goes up, okay. Log4j was a piece of software, free, uh, uh, open source, free software that a lot of people use, including companies that use it and incorporate it into their product that they then sold to customers. It turns out it had a massive vulnerability in it. So the question is, you have this computer system down in the basement chugging along with millions and billions of lines of code. Question is, is Log4j somewhere in there? And of course, you know, you may know kind of what the top level software you have is. You, you bought this package from John over here, but does John's package include Log4j as part of its repertoire? Hmm, who knows? So the idea of having a software bill of materials, just like a manufacturing bill of materials, so you know what's going on inside your software makes sense. But it turns out people also realize the same thing applies to data. So you've assembled together this data set, but this data set was assembled together by buying these people's data sets, which are assembled by buying these people's data sets. And the question is, you know, did you buy a piece of software from uh, data from Jitongana? Who the heck knows? It's buried down several levels of providence in the data. So people are beginning to realize this is a concern, especially when, I mean, I actually talked to a number of companies. They talked about Log4j and the war rooms they set up in their companies to deal with it. So when these things get to that level, people start saying, got to do something about it. Now, once again, back to your comment, what to do about it, what the regulations or say to do about it, not always clear, not always wise, but clearly there's something going on there. 
Okay, and this is some examples. So, for, and once again, you may know them more recently than I do, or different versions of it by executive order. I forgot which one. There's a lot of them rolling out. Many of which didn't go anywhere, as far as I can tell. Uh, mandatory for all vendors supplying software to federal agencies, in theory, should have an S bomb. I say in theory because I don't know exactly how tightly. It, then, of course, the this is uh, not 2023. That's like a recent year, I guess. Uh, the uh, seven, you know, HR 7900 National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, says here, uh, uh, anybody doing business with the Department of Defense or the Department of Energy are required to provide SDOM for every new and existing software contract. So these are the kinds of things that are happening. Once again, others. Likewise, what I'm going to try to do is at least look at two parts of the world. So there's, there's a tendency to be very U.S.-centric because that's where we are, at least many of us are. So it's kind of nice to know that things are, do happen elsewhere in the world. Now, because of both lack of time and lack of resources, I'm going to mainly focus on the U.S. and Europe. Obviously, things are going on in Asia, things are going on in Latin America, things are going on in Africa. But I'll just give you examples over here. So, for example, in the, in the, anybody here from Europe, by the way? Oh, a couple of them. So you can comment if I get anything totally wrong. The Cybersecurity Act requires organizations to use SPAM uh, software to uh, build materials to identify, address cyber vulnerabilities. Uh, and then the UK cyber, UK, by the way, is no longer part of the EU, so it's, it's floating in the ocean, separate from Europe, I guess. Uh, it requires organizations to maintain inventory of all software. So these are examples of the kinds of regulations that will affect your organization. Now, whether it affects your particular part of the organization or, or just indirectly, but these are regulations that are kind of, I won't say outside your control because exactly how they played out and what your company does about it, you have some control over. But these are things that are being enforced upon you from outside. Let me pause. Any, any question on this first example of the S-bomb and D-bomb kind of you know, regulations? Okay. Oh, let me go back. I'll show you. I've been reminded myself. So is any, any company, either because of regulations or just because you're a wise company, doing S-bombing or D-bombing? What, what, what prompted it? We're a defense contractor. What? We're a defense contractor. Uh, defense contractor. Okay. And you kind of so we're either, either directly yeah. the regulations or you knew they were coming, one or the other. Yeah, yeah. We're 800, 171, and 53, and then CMMC okay. level. So, so you kind of know it's all. That. Anybody yeah. wants to know what they can look forward to, they can talk to you yeah, about yeah. afterwards. Okay. Fun. okay, next one. Security by design. I want to go back in a, in a minute and ask you what that means, but let's ignore that for a minute because we don't have to worry about definitions and so on. So the idea here is that a lot of time, Organization, you know, there's several ways of phrasing it. I've talked to many, many companies. They say, we got some really tough software to write. When we get around to it, we'll add issues addressing cybersecurity, but we, right now we're very busy getting it to work. We'll come back later on and tack it on. They don't say that, but that's clear what's going on. And so, and that doesn't always work very well. So there is this notion that at day one, as you're building the software, as you're building the databases, as you're building your products, Consider and plan for how you're going to do your security. That, loosely speaking, at a philosophical level, is what uh, security by design means. Okay, it, it, it's a little bit like you know, probably when you go back to your early software programming classes, they told you lots of things you should do, which may or may not be things you ended up actually doing in real life. So this is one of these kind of good, healthy motherhood and apple pie. But now they're saying, okay, we're not just going to say it's a good idea you are going to be required to do it, where it's not clear what the it is, but you're going to be required to do it. Okay. So some examples, and once again, these are some, there are some cases where it seems, at least from what we've seen, the U.S. is ahead of the game, for better or for worse, and other cases, Europe are. This is one where there's limited so far in the U.S., mainly it's California, it turns out, has a California IoT Act that requires you to have reasonable security features planned in your products. Okay. It's a little more clear in Europe in the Network and Information Security Directive requires organizations to adhere to security by design principles, whatever they are. And there's also the Payment Services Directive 2 requires organizations to implement security by design. So this is another layer. And once again, these are only three examples of probably many, many others out there that are saying you must, and in, by the way, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, so I won't tell you exactly the case, but there was one uh, European company that just fined $14 million, which someone said, it's not a lot of money, but it's not trivial either, you know, for not doing one of these kinds of things. So these things have potential bites with them as well. 
Okay. So uh, the security by design, any of you have that notion as being a requirement for your company from outside? You may have to do it internally because of a government agency aspect or what? I have a question. No, no question, please. Uh, first, the microphone. So when you're talking about secure by design examples, there are laws in place already and have been for a while around liability for breaches. Yes. Uh, that's the other side of yeah. it. Are you are you saying this is different and above and beyond the liability approach to um, accountability and, you know? Well, I, I, to be honest, I haven't really thought how to slice it up because there's many facets of it. Uh, one thing we haven't mentioned, a lot of things really uh, overlap between security and privacy, which is another issue. So the, and many industries, particularly healthcare industries, have had a lot of issues regarding privacy. And, and many of the things, you, like for example, if your data is disclosed, that violates your privacy. It also violates your security. So a lot of these things are, are, are very closely tied to each other. So a, a lot of these ideas have been around for a while. I think what's happening now, they're ratcheting up the attention and focus on them if that's of any kind of help, okay? Let me move on. Now this one is kind of interesting. This we just, we could spend a long time on, I'll try to keep it somewhat limited, but the idea of prohibiting the paying of ransomware. I won't ask for a show of hands of how many of you pay ransomware lately, but you probably know there are organizations, like lots of organizations, that get hit with ransomware attacks, and one of the options you have to consider is whether to pay the ransomware. Well, they're trying to say that's not an option anymore. You know, now, in particular, it turns out, first, the, what's, what's the reason? What's the, why would the government want to prohibit you from paying ransomware? Just so you understand the philosophy going on here. Yes, eat your tongue. Maybe they just don't want to encourage. You don't want to, yeah. yeah. You don't want to encourage them. So in other words, if someone does a, a, a whether it be the old-fashioned days of kidnapping someone's child or kidnapping your data, if you know you're not going to make any money off of doing it, then why do it? You know, it, it, you know, obviously, it, it puts you at risk. You could be thrown to jail, blah, blah. So you only do it because you think you're going to make money. The problem, and, and once again, th these things can be very political and emotional sometimes. The problem is it works if everybody follows it. Now, it's one thing to say, as a principal, I do not think you should pay kidnappers. Well, it's my son. Well, that's a different situation. Okay, so the problem is really is, is if you can get global agreement, that's fine. And you could put a sign out front, no, we don't pay ransomware, so don't bother ransom. No. You could try that and see if that can kind of keep them away or not. But in any case, it, 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 it has a lot of appeal. And by the way, I believe the U.S. official policy for kidnapping is not to pay the ransom. But it's an official policy, it's not a law. And you do what you end up doing. <laughs> in fact, I remember one of the earliest ransomware attacks we studied happened to be a police station that was attacked, it was actually, I think, Tewksbury, Massachusetts. And the FBI people came in and they said, well, what do we do? Should I pay the ransom? And I said, well, is there any valuable data you need? <laughs> so anyway, so that's the issue there. And once again, it, this is kind of a, a, an emerging area, it may fizzle out, but in the United States, North Carolina, as a state, has passed a, a, a regulation that prohibits public entities, that is, other state agencies, and such from paying ransom. They don't yet you know, control, uh, often things start off on the government side, whether it be local governments, state governments, or federal governments. But also Pennsylvania, New York, Florida, Arizona, and Texas all either have or are considering seriously passing similar regulations. Now this one I don't know a lot about. Anybody here from the financial services industry? So maybe I don't know. This is what I, that sounds pretty ominous, if you will, to the act of 2021 that prohibits any U.S. financial institution from making a ransom payment in excess of $100,000 without authorization of Treasury. Now, the fact is that it implies that, they, well, we will let you go at some time. So at least it's kind of a little bit of a gray zero there. But I don't quite know exactly how much, because obviously financial organizations are clearly one of the many popular targets uh, for ransomware attacks. So likewise, there are similar things going on. Now, I think we mentioned this earlier, GDPR, as you know, is primarily a privacy regulation, but a lot, it's, it's a map, well, I'm saying that, it's, it's got lots of parts to it. And there are some parts of it that have some implications here. But then there are others here, uh, the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity is providing guidelines and direction. So this is an emerging area. I'm just giving you examples of the kinds of things 
that regulations either are happening or seem to be movement towards regulations. Okay. Let me ask a question then. And I, I'll close my eyes. Uh, how many of you, uh, well, first of all, the first question is not controversial. How many of you have a company policy, I'm not saying what it is, have a company policy regarding ransomware? A few of you have a policy. Do either one anyone tell me what the policy is? Okay. <laughs> okay. The point being here, this is something that in rea reality-wise, you should assume at some point your company will be hit with ransomware. I mean, it's just you know, it's like getting the cold in wintertime. It's just going to happen. So having a policy kind of prevents you from running around like a chicken without its head, if you will, uh, when, it, when it does happen. Okay. Okay, data governance. Does anybody involving the CDO care about data governance, I wonder? Okay, now data governance, is, it covers a host of areas, obviously, a host of topics. Uh, obviously, many of the things we want to talk about here involve things like the confidentiality of data, the disclosure of data, and a lot of things related to privacy and security, because data governance covers many other things as well. One of the topics, though, that, that been around for a while, but it really is, and it wasn't driven solely by cybersecurity, but it has a high overlap with cybersecurity, is issue of data localization. Do any of you have organizations that are affected by data localization? First, do you know what I'm talking about? First, let, me, let me ask you the question. Does anybody here have an organization that is affected by data localization? Well, nobody, that's surprising. So let me tell you what it normally means, if you will. Is, it, is it, this is typically done at the country level. Is it any data that involves the citizens of the country or activities you're doing in, in our country, that data must stay in our country. So if you're a French company, for example, and you've got employees, you've got customers, you've got manufacturing sites, all of that data that is you know, French-based must stay in France. In fact, I've lost track of the latest safe harbor, there's been there's issues between the EU and the USA as to when they will allow data to leave Europe, if you will. And I can't remember, I think it's fallen apart again. They've been trying to reach some kind of agreement. Why would you ever want to have a data localization law? And Dr. Madnick, we think about it as sovereignty, data sovereignty also. Uh, yeah, in a different the data sovereignty, good point, yeah. good point, exactly. Why would you want it? Because we don't want our data going overseas. Exactly. And vice but, versa. But I don't know how many people have ever watched these, these uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, justice movies and so on. And you see the FBI coming in and carrying out the computers and carrying out the files. Okay, your company is going to be investigated. I want to take your data. Well, it's over in Singapore. Uh, we have a truck outside. <laughs> what are we going to do? So there's lots of reasons. It can be philosophical, sovereignty. It can be practical. If you want to do a raid on a company and the data ain't there, there ain't much to raid. So there's lots of reasons behind why data sovereignty. But that's only one of many aspects of data governance. Many of them, I think, are driven by issues regarding privacy, particularly in the area of healthcare, if you will. But also in the EU, besides the GDPR, there, in fact, is a data governance act. Now, there's several Europeans here. Uh, I'm not too expert. Is anybody here familiar with the data governance act in the EU? Okay, well, it, it, pro it promotes data exchange between companies and public institutions and encouraging economic and scientific potential data. And in some sense, it's almost the opposite of cybersecurity. It basically is, is basically encouraging the sharing of data. But the point being I'm saying is things that you think of be, about being data governance is not limited to how you, what you think is good in your company. These are things that are being either encouraged or being required from outside your organization. Uh, and then, of course, there is the new e-privacy directive and the network and information security directive, too. Uh, it, it wants to ensure that organizations are meeting the data government's obligations, whatever that means. So once again, a lot of things you thought of as being kind of things you decide in your own company, now they're outside organizations looking over your shoulder. Once again, all this is fairly new. A lot of times things will not be sorted out until the court cases come through and we see, you know, how much the government is overreaching, how much the government is going to further uh, and get involved. Okay. Now, the one I want to spend, uh, we got about, yeah, about half an hour left, on is this, the one I find to be fun and confusing. This is required incident reporting. The idea being, if there is a cyber attack in your organization, you should tell people about it. 
Now, can anybody imagine any reason why you wouldn't want to do that? Come on. Good. You left holes in your system, your network, and you let someone in by mistake. You yeah. Know, you don't well, want to be embarrassed. There's several reasons. One of them is just plain reputational. You know, do you want to do you want to put your money in a bank that was just ripped off last week? You know, is that that's not necessarily a good thing to do. So number one is, is reputational. Second thing, and this apparently is quite common, copycat. Because whatever you're gonna to do to fix things, it's not gonna happen overnight. So if someone figures out there must be a big hole in the back of your vault, let's go look for it too. So the idea of copycats, you know, once they know that you're vulnerable. And, and then of course, there's a whole issue of, of, of uh, how can I can't say this, uh, l legal issues. Uh, there have been cases of stockholder suits. There have been issues of a, a number of, of uh, customer claims. No, my data was stolen. So if you can keep it quiet, you can kind of mini minimize somewhat some of the legal act. And there are probably other reasons why. In fact, I talked to several executives, they say when you bring the lawyers in the room, the first thing they tell you is don't say anything. That, that's rule number one in the lawyer uh, uh, book. So in case here, one thing that maybe many of you knew about, but I didn't at the time necessarily, you may remember back in 2021, Colonial Pipeline, which supplies most of the fuel uh, for the, the east coast of the United States, was hit with a, a cyber attack. There was no law requiring them to tell anybody about it. Now, as it turns out, 20,000 gasoline stations shut down. So you might get suspicious after a while, but there was no law that required them to report it. There were laws largely driven by privacy issues, like HIPAA and so on. So if someone's credit card data was stolen, there are certain, once again, not clear how comprehensive they are, but certain laws you have to notify people who are affected by it. But if your pipeline shuts down, there's no private personal data that's exposed in that case. Here's an interesting question I didn't realize at the time. Who regulates Colonial Pipeline? It is regulated, by the way. And they have passed regulations now requiring reporting. The Department of Transportation. They are a carrier. Yeah. So in any case, the reason I mentioned because all kinds of agencies, you know, cropping up and so different agencies. So now there are requirements for them to report things and so on. Uh, okay, so that, that's just a little bit about the issue. Now, flipping it around the other way around, I just ask you, what, what are some of the reasons why you might not be tempted to announce that your organization? By the way, I should tell you, and I, I can't remember which one it was. Uh, and I, sad, but there's been a number of shootings, as you know, in schools and such. And the, one of the more, more recent ones happened, and it was only because of the shooting that people realized that the city had been shut down for a week due to a cyber attack. And of course, you know, it, it, it's some town, some place that nobody really cares about, not going to make the national news. Shootings make national news, and all of a sudden the spotlight is shining on them. So there are lots of places, whether it be cities, towns, hospitals, you know, uh, organization of all kinds that get hit with cyber attacks. And they try to keep it as quiet as possible. They try to get up and running as soon as possible and hope nobody notices. Uh, but but they, they go on all the time. So, here, so the question is, why, why would you want organizations to report that? You want to comment? Or a different question? I saw your hand going up a minute. I don't, I don't want to interrupt you. Oh, yeah. No, it's fine. No, no I'm asking. OK, go ahead. So oh, yeah, I was going to say. Um, well, for SEC, their SEC is about to require yeah. it, right? They haven't quite got to the final yep. point. There's we'll all talk about that in a minute. Go ahead. Keep going. Uh, yeah, yeah. But what, what, why, why would the and SEC? The reason is because, you, you know, as a shareholder, you'd want to know that they've had a major cyber attack, right? Exactly. So that's the SEC's point. So just like if, you, if your company is being sued, the stockholders want to know you're being sued and you may lose hundreds of millions of dollars. In the same vein, if your company... Now, I'm going to clarify one thing. I'm sorry, I, I, I should have done this a bit earlier. When I get into some of the, uh, I use the term here, incident reporting. I didn't say breach reporting or cyber attack reporting. Now, once again, uh, and this is true, I've learned over the century, I've been involved with computer science for about 50 years. Almost none of the terms are very well defined, by the way, I, I've learned. Uh, but, but it turns out an incident is not the same as a cyber attack. An incident is something that, and the analogy I use with the airline industry, they talk about near misses. And I think the, the rule of thumb is if two planes are less than 500 feet apart, that's called a near miss. That means they didn't hit each other, nobody died, but that should not have happened. And if that did happen, then something went wrong. We should understand what went wrong and try to make sure it doesn't happen again. 
So the idea of an incident, and once again, not well-defined, but if you kind of read the fine print, in most cases, isn't talking just about successful cyber attacks, but things that either are attempted cyber attacks that were not completely successful, or things that were close to being successful cyber attacks. So incident is a much broader notion than just a full-blown cyber attack. So it, externally, almost no one would know that you had a near miss. You know, it's not even, no gas stations closed down because nothing actually happened. But something did happen, it just didn't affect the organization in the full. So the whole issue here is, is, is what is the definition of incident reporting? Here's some examples here. Dr. Madnick. Oh yeah, please, go ahead. One more question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yes, so I was wondering as you were talking, um, I was listening. Don't yeah, worry. Uh, good. <laughs> um, Better than sleeping, I appreciate that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. Um, <laughs> Where in all of this comes in the motive for the cyber attack? Like ah. Is phishing? Is it granted <coughs> employees that were fired? Is it uh, a foreign state? Is it a reason of IP? What, where's the, the motive behind it comes into view in terms of this is where you have to report it or not? Excellent. I, that, in many ways, that's a, a nice, somewhat subtle way of getting it. I'm going to do it in the next slide. So, so hold off for a minute or two if you don't mind. But keep that in abeyance. So there are a number of examples, I mentioned regulations. So the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act, or you all know, CIRCA, CIRCIA, requires organizations who operate critical infrastructure. Now it turns out that's a lot of organizations. Besides power grids and oil pipelines, it includes financial services, it includes healthcare. I think maybe pizza, pizza shops may be exempt, I don't know about that. Although, if you get hungry, they sure seem like they're pretty critical. Okay, so that covers an awful lot. And of course, they've already mentioned the Securities Exchange, SEC. And once again, as far as I know, this is still in discussion. It's been kind of in discussion for quite a while because a lot of organizations are not keen on doing some of the things that SEC really wanted to do, and they've kind of tried to find compromise. But it requires companies to report incidents. And remember, incidents is not necessarily a, a full breach. It's something that could have led to one or whatever. Uh, such as financial fraud, cyber breaches, insider trading that have a material impact on the company's financial condition. Now, as far as I know, this business about a material impact was an addition. It was not in the original proposal I saw floating around. And so this is kind of what I call the escape clause. They're saying, well, you know, they only stole $100 million. We're a big corporation. We spend that much on paper clips. It's not material. We don't have to report it. I'm joking a little bit, I think. I'm not sure. So the idea now is that uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a full breach, it doesn't have to be an attempted breach, but it has to be an attempted breach which could have made dire consequences, not just minor consequences. So a lot of these regulations are in the embryonic stage, they're being formulated and with a fair amount, in this case, a fair amount of pushback from the industry. Likewise, in the EU, there's the NIS Network and Information Securities Director requires organizations to have an incident reporting process in place if they experience any incidents that can have a substantial impact on their systems. So this issue of incident reporting. Now, I, 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 I asked a question and I forgot I asked it, so let me go back to it again. Why? You know, why all these different, reg and this is only a tip of the iceberg, I think there's probably 20 or 30 different regulations we've come across that have this kind of element to it. Why do you want to know? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, speaker. Yep. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was actually listening. <laughs> I, was listening. Oh. <laughs> I think it goes back to, um, I think it goes back to trust, yeah. but in a different way. It's the public's trust that yeah. the system is actually working and someone's monitoring to make sure that issues are addressed when they happen. Yeah. Now, now it, it, what, what I'm gonna say in a minute here is there are multiple different reasons, some of which may be very similar, some may be very different. Some may raise the issue regarding motives. So it might, you know, you might like to know that North Korea is on a binge right now uh, I, I'm not sure, but I, be, I believe I was told that most of its uh, of its foreign currency it comes from cyber attacks. That's the, and so when, when they when they find the coffers running low, they kind of ratchet up. The, so in any case, there's lots of motivations, whether it be criminals, whether it be nation states that don't don't get along all that well. Uh, one of the more interesting ones are hacktivists. You know, people who just take a disliking to you. Aren't we also sort of mimicking other? Types of incidents, you mentioned the airlines yeah. and securities and yeah. that business, there are things that aren't incidents per se in the cyber sense, but 
But I think I think that you raise an interesting issue because a lot of the things, particularly hacktivists, you know, whether they whether they steal an airplane or blow up a building, but I think there's several things that make cybersecurity more appealing. One is is the issue of attribution. And not only attribution, geographical attribution. In other words, it could be someone from Romania knocking out your, 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 your hospital, if you will. So a lot of things you, that if you happen to be angry at someone or want to do something at, the things you can do are things that often are, you can be more easily caught or punished for. There is a sense, maybe not 100% accurate, that you can get away with a lot more stuff. So it's kind of an easier route to go. I'll give you a digression. How many people here are familiar with Boston Children's Hospital? Does that name mean about you? It's very famous. It's one of the best children's hospitals in the world. Does anybody know it was hit by a major cyber attack? I want to say now two and a half, three years ago. You know about? Do, do, do you know much about the story? You want to say much? No, no. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what I've heard, which may not be accurate, but it's a great story. So it's good. take it with a word. It was not a nation state. As far as it, apparently it was, it was a single individual. So you can go anywhere from massive resource, because most cyber attacks are relatively low tech in the sense of requiring major breakthroughs, because most organizations hate to have, have back doors open all over the place. So it, it takes effort, but not a huge effort. Supposedly, the story I heard was this individual living somewhere in the Boston area read a story in a newspaper about some child, I'll say a four-year-old girl, I don't know what it was, who was apparently mistreated at Children's Hospital. He said, well, I'm gonna teach them a lesson. So that just gives an example of how things crop up. And he knocked the hospital off the grounds for quite a while. So I'm not sure the story is close to true or not. Go ahead. <laughs> off the record, as you say. Well, so Boston Children was the first one. It wasn't the only one. It wasn't the only there one. were a number of children's hospitals that were attacked. And it was not one person. It was a group that was really um, an activist group um, that was focusing on transgender care ah. or focusing against mm. providers and entities yeah. that provide transgender. So it was more of, I would say, um, a statement yeah, than anything else? Yeah, I, I, so I said, I mean, there, I was, I was saying there's all kinds of motives. I mean, you, that, you know, getting money is kind of a very obvious motive, but a lot of the other motives are a bit more, not obvious, but obviously exist in the real world. Should I tell you the question? No, oh, I thought, I thought you raise your hand. Okay, let me move on. So, let me go, okay. So I'm gonna spend maybe 15 or 20 minutes talking about this issue, because this is called a real-time research going on. I'm gonna get some feedback, if you will. Required incident reporting. Okay, as I said, it's been a big issue, of a lot of attention. Uh, now here's a question. Let's talk now about actual cyber attacks. Let's go more narrow than incidents, but ones that actually do steal data, shut you down, whatever. What percent of them do you think are publicly reported? How many people think it's 25% or more? How many people think it's, I don't know why I have 18%, 18% or more? How many people think it's 10% or more? How many people think it's 1% or more? There we go, okay. So the point being, as I say, we don't know what we don't know. So one of the reasons for having reporting is, you know, are the number of cyber attacks up or down this year? Now, the number reported may be up or down, but if we're talking about 1.5% becomes 2%, becomes a quarter of a percent, we're talking about noise. It's not clear whether it's really a trend or not if we're only getting a teeny fraction, and it's a relatively random fraction we're getting. So one of the reasons, and I'm going to go through a list of different reasons, is just to know what's going on out there. And there have been times where ransomware attacks are on the, apparently on the rise, and other times when ransomware attacks seem to be on, on the decline. There are certain times where, in particular, rumor is, once again, rumor means that data is useless, and you all guys, CDOs, you understand why having useful data is much better than useless data. But there is, there is the rumor, if you will, that particularly state government agencies, hospitals, and universities. Now, plausibly, why would that make sense? I mean, it may not be accurate, but why would that be plausible to be the, the popular targets in the last year or two? Anyone want to speculate? You know why. They had a low-hanging fruit. Now, if you look at, you know, how much, what, I don't know what the number is, but, you know, uh, J.P. Morgan, what is their cybersecurity budget? 1.4 billion, I don't know, but some number like that. 
you know, your local hospital is $7.25. You know, we bought a pair, we bought you know, a subscription to McAfee, that's it. Okay, so the point being is, you know, uh, you know cyber criminals, if you will, are, you know, are pretty smart. They say, you know, we, we're, you know, obviously the banks have all the money, but they have guards and so on. These guys are kind of just leaving the door wide open, just go in and, you know, maybe get a smaller wheelbarrow full of money, but we still can get it. So in any case, so one of the many reasons was just to get a better idea of what's going on out there at the high level. Okay, but lots of complexities. I've already kind of said much of this already, and that is what is an incident? I'm not sure, I think this is from one of the government uh, publications. I, I'll check the citation. I, I find others are much more interesting than this one, but it has the word actually or imminently jeopardizes. So the actually is actual. Imminently jeopardizes, kind of vague. What does that really mean? And over here, constant a violation or imminent threat. Once again, so a lot of times you'll find, and these are not the only what I call weasel words, but you'll find words like this where I go back to my near miss notion. I mean, the airline industry they kind of defined it, you know, 500 feet, but cybersecurity is kind of vaguer than that, and it's harder to define things very precisely. Go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah, go. so I've got a question about the definition. Yeah. I remember a case where it was an old lady that was cammed. Yeah and her savings were wiped out, yeah. was the bank responsible mm -hmm. to a certain extent? So it, when you say there's an accident, an incident, yeah. does that count as one? Is there a proper, well, yeah, that, clear that definition? Def well, that and is a bank, you know, was supposed to protect that old lady from, from having her savings stolen? stolen. Well, there's several different issues here. Uh, for what, what you're describing, I would say that is an actual event. It's not just it's not just an, not just a incident being a possible. So it's something actually happened, uh, if you will. One of the things, and I, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's on my slides. Is I have a paper about this. Something I di I didn't fully aware. How many people understand how wire transfers work in general? Financial wire transfers. Okay, most of you do. The thing I you know I'm more, most of us are more used to credit cards. And I, I don't know why, someone apparently in the West Coast, somewhere I want to say in San Diego, was ordering things from Taco Bell for about a month on my credit card number. I don't know how we got it. You can, better, basically you can get it on the internet. I used to joke to people, if you forget your password, don't worry, $15, I can look it up for you. So, so, uh, so how we got it, I don't know. But the, but the point being, if you will, is that there's all kinds of, of, of things going on uh, around the world. Uh, you know, in terms of, of, of data being stolen. But in a case like this, with a credit card, you call the, the credit card company and say, it wasn't me, and they give you the money back 99.4% of the time. I don't know, if, maybe 100% of the time. If you do a wire transfer and you send it to the wrong place, once it's gone, there's a little weasel room there, but essentially, once it's gone, it's gone. And the kind of scam, I'm not sure the scam you're talking about, but the kind of scam that's very popular, mostly older people, but anybody in this room, how many people here have bought a house in the last two or three years? You guys, I guess COVID, you guys stayed in the house, and stayed home pretty a lot. Well, one of the things that usually happens when you're buying a house is you have to transfer funds. In the old days, it used to require it be a bank, a bank check. It turns out bank checks can be scammed pretty easily. So it turns out most places require it be a wire transfer. And so the, and this has been a number of articles about that if you read different magazines. The classic scam goes as follows. First they do, they break into, the, the lawyers are another popular target for this reason. They break into a lawyer's office. They find out what you know, closings of, of, you know, are taking place this week. You've probably been told by the uh, escrow agent or the transfer agent or whatever involved, that you have to transfer the money to an escrow account so we know we got the money, could we act as the intermediary so we you know we, we, when we transfer the deed, you know, you, the owner gets the money, blah, 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 all that stuff. And in general, because you know, these things sometimes get messed up, we encourage you to do it a day or two in advance. What you do is you get an email apparently from that same law firm or same escrow agent saying, oh, things have been very messy lately. We'd like to have you do it three days before. And here's the, you know, the, the wire transfer instructions you should tell your bank. It's happened about 13,000 times so far in the last year or two. I'm not sure. FBI report on that. <laughs> and the, the sad story, I hear, I'm not sure it's true or not, it was a couple I'm not sure if they're moving somewhere from the East Coast, maybe in Boston, 
to Chicago, a new job and so on. They had just sold their house and they decided to buy a nicer house in Chicago. So they took all the money from the sale of the house they just sold, plus the money they had in their savings, to buy this new house in Chicago. But the money went askew. So they got a phone call while driving in their car from Boston to Chicago that say, you are now homeless and, by the way, broke. Eh, talk about a nice conversation to have on the phone. So in any case, so, so wire transfer type frauds are, are very potent because uh, there are lots of ways they can pull these things off and the consequence to the, to the victims, much like the one you're describing, can be quite caught. I'm not saying it was a wire transfer fraud. There are lots of other kinds of frauds, but that's one of the popular, I apologize for a long discussion, but this was a lot of stuff I didn't fully appreciate. In fact, anybody who buys a house recently, new, you'll often find in red letters on one of the documents will say, please be careful. Please call the bank and verify the following details before you send the money. Because if you send the money to the wrong place, we are not held responsible. Okay. Uh, I, I talked about the issue of aircraft near misses or close calls. Now, here's a question. I'm going to have a vote, if you will. I'm going to give you a list of things that happen or can happen, actually do happen, in most organizations. If there was a law saying you must report an incident, and an incident, remember I said before, is not necessarily a breach, but is something that is a precursor to a breach, is something that you should be worried about or concerned about, and therefore may be reported. Let me start off with this one. Uh, someone tries to log into your system, maybe multiple time, but fails, because they keep having the wrong password. Is that something you should report? You said, no, why? It's so common. I mean, I don't it's so common. <laughs> yeah, good. If it's something like coding times. What, please? If it's like uh, my, microphone, please. I'm sorry. <laughs> good. Uh, I would say that it depends. If it's something like thousand time and systematic trial, <laughs> then it should be. But uh, if it's something like a couple of times manually. Yeah. What drives me crazy is some of the organization I go with, if I do it wrong three times, they lock me out. I don't know how many of you realize it's hard to remember your password on this place. So, you know, I think three times is much, much too limited. But obviously, they try a hundred times uh, or a thousand times or whatever, then it looks like someone is definitely trying to break into your thing. They may be trying, you know, your home address, your phone number, all the, all the normal things. I was told there are 10 things about you that will get into 10% of all the people's accounts like your birthday, whatever the answer. In any case, so, so that's one that may indicate that someone is targeting you, okay? But not, not a lot of hands went up on that one. Here's another one. Uh, a, a phishing email is reported in your company. So it's an, it's an email that they see has targeted your company. It's a, a classic one is, we have been under cyber attack. <laughs> to help us defend our company against those evil people, we're requiring you to change your password. Please follow the procedure below. I call that diabolical, because you're trying to do a good deed. And in fact, you're giving your password array to some crook someplace. How many people think that's something should be reported? I see two or three hands go up, okay. Now, remember, I was talking about you know, a, a phishing attack, a spear phishing attack, you know, what spear phishing means a highly crafted one. So rather than dear occupant, or what that says, it says, uh, hello there, you know, Jitong. Uh, it was great that we had uh, lunch together yesterday, but I have a small favor to ask of you. You know, when you get that kind of stuff, I mean, a classic example is from the CEO to the CFO. That's a classic case. So it was great to get together with dinner for your wife last Wednesday. We've got to do that again. We're about to acquire a company in, in Asia. We need to hire, we have a law firm over there that's willing to help represent us. Please transfer $250,000 to that. But P.S., by the way, uh, I can't, I would have called you on the phone, but I'm going to be attending this talk by Madnick here in Cambridge, so I'm not reachable by phone. You try calling his, his secretary, can I talk to the boss? No, the boss is in Cambridge listening to this Madnick guy. Well, what are you going to do? You got clear direction from the boss. You, they, you've acquired companies in the past. No, it sure seems like him, doesn't it? So that's what I mean by a spear phishing. So let's say you get one, but you don't fall for it. Would you want to report it? How many people think you should report it? The question is, yeah. 
Ah, we haven't talked about the issue to whom. That's, that's the other issue. But, well, internal report is one thing. Most of these cases are, are talking about external. Now, where the external is to a uh, po police type organization, FBI or, or whatever, it turns out, I didn't realize it, but the uh, uh, secret police play a major role in this because a lot of money issues, that, like counterfeiting type. Yeah. Can I say, uh, Dr. Uh, Madnick, yeah. I think my manager, who's the CIO, yeah. does not want to report it unless it's a real incident. Yeah. As a data guy, I want to get every piece exactly. Of data I can. So that's why you see different opinions about it because you want to know more and more what's going on. But for all the obvious publicity reasons, let me keep it going quickly. Now, remember I said before, Log4j is one of these pieces of software that has a, a basically a huge hole in it that you can run a truck through. Okay. You may not know you have log4j, but there, I guess there are some ways you can test for it by looking for certain traits and tell if you have log4j. So if you determine that there are people pinging certain ports or doing certain things that looks like the kind of thing people do if they're looking to see if you have log4j in your system, would you want to report that to anybody outside your organization? So, so kind of saying the organization, if this, for example, is the Department of Energy's nuclear plant data agency that's going to basically tell you how a terrorist can steal tons of plutonium, you may be more concerned about it than if it's Joe's Pizza stand. So there can be a number of reasons why some may be viewed as higher value targets. Another one, now here's getting tricky. Someone actually, whether because they guessed the password or because of some vulnerability in your software, gets into your system, but your system is kind of, you know, ML, whatever, looking around and somehow realizes something bad is going on and shuts them out before they've done any harm. But they did get in. They just didn't get far enough to do harm. Should that be reported? Because remember, they actually got in. I see two of the hands go up. I see another hand go up. This is even a subtle one. Someone got into your system and actually did something. How many people know what crypto mining is? Crypto mining, for those who don't know, the idea being is, you know, to build things like Bitcoins, there's certain computation you have to do. So what they do is they plant some software on your computer, so it's chugging away in the background, doing these calculations. If it gets a Bitcoin now and then, it ships them off to you. But it's not disrupting your operation. It may slow your computer down a little bit, but you probably have excess capacity anyways. In fact, it can argue it keeps your computer warm, keeping it busy, it doesn't get too bored. So it isn't doing kind of what I call harm to your company, to your computer, but it's like having someone sleep, come, break into your office at night and sleeping on your couch and very neatly tidying it up in the morning. So no harm is done, but it's just not something you normally want. Should that be reported? Let's see if your hands go up. A lot of you either don't like to report anything or are very shy. I bring this up because to the best of my knowledge, I've not seen anybody come up with a list. They come up with these jaw things, if an incident occurs, report it. But they don't say what an incident is. And so I'm saying, well, let's you know, get some yeses and noes. You know, is this something that should be reported or is it not? Okay, so that's something we're doing there. Anybody have a different example I want to put forward or something that might be controversial that some might think yes? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry about that. Getting your, ex getting your exercise. <laughs> so... I'm going to draw an analogy, yeah. right? So you're using the airline example. I'll, I'll use the bank. Yeah. Um, from a layered security model, just because somebody got past the security guard, yeah. that's not a big deal. If they got past the cashier, if they got the manager's key, if they got into the vault, yeah. each of them have different securities yeah. in place. Different layers, yeah. And they finally have the access to a particular person's lockbox. Safe deposit box, box yeah. Right? Um, at what point does it become an imminent threat? Yeah. And um, like, especially for data systems, layered security measures are in place, right? Until you get to the point that you being the hacker or the attacker, you've gotten access to the source data that you want access to. And even then, you gotta be able to egress it. There are egress controls that can be put in place, right? So, so an imminent incident, I think, can be defined by proximity mm. to whatever the control is trying to protect, yeah. right? So 
So let me, let me I, 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 that's why I don't think he liked the definition he put up, but, but it happens to be the most official, you can see that's the government official one, although there are many others. Uh, I, I think I like the word maybe potential better than imminent. Because if, for example, someone made it past the security guard, made it past the tellers, and let's say got into the vault but hasn't yet got to the safe deposit vaults, that should not have happened. None of those three things should have happened. And the fact that they did happen means there's something deficient going on. You know, the security guard went for lunch and didn't you know, do anything, the, the, whatever. So from my point of view, I'm not saying everything should be reported, but I'm saying there is something there. I have a paper, what I call the, called the rest of the story. There was a famous radio uh, uh, person, you may remember, I forgot his name now. But you'll probably remember. Uh, yes. And he would, tell, he would take some story you all of us know about, and then he'd talk with the rest of the story, but he didn't know. And I often say, if you read the articles of most cyber attacks that get reported, most don't, they'll say things. What happened was there was a piece of software that people neglected to patch. And the implication being, well, we've now patched that software, now we can all go about life. We've studied it. In the same, in that particular organization, we found 16 other failures in the organization. But you know, typically you point to one, an easy to fix one, everybody's happy you fixed it and they go about life. So the fact that there were 16 other doors wide open is something you really want to pay attention to. I mean, this is, yeah, Can I analogize ahead. this with the financial markets? I spent a lot of time working with big banks and mm -hmm. investors and exchanges streaming tens of millions of quotes per second yeah. in the global markets. But only a few thousand of those actually turned out to be trades. Yeah. It turns out looking at that order book and all those quotes that are away from the money is really informative. Yeah. So, so I want to see as much data as I yeah. can and see what's trending and, and what's yeah. where the information is going. Let me wrap up, and I do want to have at least some room because you're raising a, what I call the hot issue here is that too much data has a problem also. It can be overwhelming. And so we have this interesting kind of problem here. It, we want more so we know what's going on, but at some, in the, I was told, once again, anecdotally, so I don't know the actual facts, you may remember Target, which is a, a retail department store, was attacked. I was told the day of the attack there were 30,000 exceptions reported, which means that there's, whether it was ML or pre-ML, something unusual, peculiar that should be looked into. Well, how many people does it take to look into 30,000 possible incidents. So it, it, it's a, that's what I'm saying, it's a double-edged sword here. Okay. Uh, some timing difference, I told you, in, in, in some difference. In India reports must be filed within six hours. In the EU, must be filed within 72 hours. The SEC says must be within four days, but only if it's determining material, which of course might take four months to determine that. Uh, and I just mentioned it could take it long. And, you know, so then, and how many people here have been looking at or as much aware? Because the SEC one, it probably one that's got the most attention because it's, the bickering is going on quite a bit over a period of time. Anybody here deeply involved in the SEC one at all? Because it affects pretty much every public company, not just financial organizations. Okay. Uh, now, this, we touched about this a little bit earlier. I'm going to do it real quickly here. Why do you want to report and what should you report? I haven't talked about the where yet, that's another issue altogether, but the why and the what. So for example, it might be just to know something's going on out there. You don't know much about it, but you know that 500 you know, banks have been hit this week. Or I think there's one week, 128 towns in Texas were ransomware. Okay. So just to know, you don't know much about how it happened, you don't know much details about it, you just know that it happened, like a fire happened, kind of thing. Another one, the method used. Well, how they break it? Well, it turns out there are lots of different kinds of approaches, different kinds, like the log 4J I mentioned before. So it might be, you no, know, well, gee whiz, there's a particular kind of vulnerability that lots of other organizations have. Possibly I have it too. And so it might be good to know about that, if you will. It turns out, one thing, at least according to one report I saw, there is the National Vulnerability Database, which if you discover kind of a, a hole or a flaw in software, you report it, if you will. There's about 200,000 vulnerabilities listed. I don't know how, odds are you've got at least 10 or 20,000 in your company, just, just fact of life. Uh, but it turns out for ransomware attacks, only about 288 of them are actually being used. So in other words, if you try to turn your the software people were, could randomly patch those 200,000, you might be wasting a lot of effort. 
if you focus on those 288, you may be saving yourself a lot. So if you don't know how people are doing these attacks, you won't necessarily be, use your resources most effectively to ward them out. Impact. Now, this gets a little bit more to the SEC, although SEC doesn't seem to really talk about it explicitly. How much did it impact your business? You know, not, how many days were you offline, like Colonial Pipeline? How much money did you lose? What other consequences have occurred? We have a paper just recently, the fact that your cyber insurance goes up the next year. I mean, it's amazing. You know, people often talk about what happens in the 30, 60 days after the cyber attack. There are lots of things that kind of occur over time, both positive and negative things. So understanding. Now, the first thing you can know in within 24 hours. This one here, you're not going to know in 24 hours. You may know it in six months. You may know it in a year, but not overnight. Current status. Okay, you were hit with a big cyber attack, you know, six months ago. What's your status now? I, I remember I was in England talking. I remember universities get hit a lot. I'll wrap up in one minute. Uh, and they mentioned how they were hit, and in three days they're up and running. He said, well, what they mean by that is that the things that were people facing, like the student registration system, they're up and running. We're still three months waiting to be up. So the point being here is that, you know, often what happens is they'll kind of triage and they'll start to kind of get things glued together. But you don't know if six months later if there's really you know, still impact going on. So what do they learn from it? So that's about it. What should you do? Well, just you know, For those who haven't thought about it, and once again, it may not necessarily be your personal responsibility, but any of you who has a role in the organization, these are things that are going to be going on. And to send, either they're going to impact you or you may have some say in the matter about them, if you will. As I said, uh, there are policies issues, there are data issues, regulators, and so on. And th these are just two relatively high level, they're three or four page long papers, but they really start to kind of tease out some of the things I mentioned today. For those who are interested, we have longer 10, 20 page papers, boring, but they get into much more of the details of these things going on. In any case, thank you very much. Uh, those who have interest in this topic, it's an ongoing research effort we have, so I'll be glad to talk to you, learn what your experiences are, have a, you know, give, give us some suggestions and references we don't know. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Madness. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank hey. you very much.